In 2004, Nintendo squeezed two full screens, a stylus, and the ability to play both DS and Game Boy Advance games into something smaller than your wallet. Critics called it a desperate gimmick, but it became Nintendo's best-selling console ever. So how did they fit all that stuff inside, and why did it work when no one thought it would? I spent way too much time modeling the entire DS, so we can explore its history, the tech inside, and the legacy it left. But before we know how Nintendo made the DS, we need to know why. In the early 2000s, Nintendo Nintendo wasn't exactly struggling, there were still the handheld overlords, sitting on a decade's worth of Game Boy Millions, and their latest console, the Game Boy Advance, was, shockingly, selling ridiculously well and keeping them comfortably ahead. So why then risk it all by making something completely different instead of squeezing out another decade of Game Boy slop? For one reason only. The PlayStation 2 was dominating the market, and when Sony announced a handheld powerful enough to overshadow anything Nintendo had, executives started sweating marbles. It was clear the status quo wasn't going to cut it. Nintendo needed to move fast before the PSP showed up and made their handhelds look like Happy Meal toys. They didn't have many options. They could make a new Game Boy, chase raw power, and go head to head with the PSP, a fight they knew they couldn't win. Or they could take the riskier route, make something so weird that no one would dare compare it to the PSP, and hope to god it actually worked. In the end, the call came from Nintendo's late president, Hiroshi Yamauchi. He pitched the idea of a dual-screen console, one that could succeed Game Boy Advance while breaking new ground with features like touchscreen and backwards compatibility. Not everyone was on board though, Satoru Okada, head of Nintendo's hardware research, said the developers hated this idea and thought it did not make any sense. Even then president Satoru Iwata was skeptical. And Yes, I am aware that everyone is named the same, and believe me, it's just as confusing for me. Despite both Satoru's disagreeing about the dual-screen concept, Yamauchi's decision stuck, and the team scrapped their existing prototype codenamed Iris and began work on what would become Project Nitro. The Nintendo DS was designed in Kyoto's Minamiku district, home to Nintendo's headquarters since 1889. Every major decision in Nintendo's history, from Game Boy development to that ridiculous price bump on the Switch, traces back to the city. Nintendo has several buildings across Kyoto, the main headquarters and two research and development centers. Engineers often move between them, but Research and Development 1, responsible for the DS's hardware, was most often based at this address I'm not even going to try pronouncing. It was here that Satoru Okada's team actually developed the DS. And it wasn't easy, they had to cram in two screens, a touchscreen, a full backwards compatibility, all into something that still had to fit in your pocket, at a time when those technologies were still in their infancy. In other words, good looks weren't the focus, just making the thing actually work was. And honestly, the original DS didn't exactly win any beauty pageants. Early reactions called it bulky, boxy, and even ugly or clanky. And I have to agree, after spending a week modeling it, I nearly gave myself an aneurysm over some of its tiny design details. Luckily, Nintendo realized they had accidentally invented a handheld equivalent to Frankenstein's monster and just two years later dropped the DS Lite. The main challenge of designing the DS was actually packing two 3-inch LCD screens into a clamshell design. Both screens were identical, a cost-saving measure that meant the same part could be manufactured for either position. But here's where the team encountered its first major problem. Nintendo's first instinct was to make both screens touch-capable, but testing revealed a fatal flaw. Fingers and the stylus would constantly block the view of important visual information on the small display. The solution was rather simple, put the touchscreen on the bottom. That way players could scribble without their hands blocking the main action on the top screen. Nintendo chose the resistive touchscreen screen technology not because it was better but because it was cheaper. It was less sensitive than modern capacitive screens but could register input from both the stylus and the finger. The idea of two screens wasn't new, Yamauchi had been obsessed with it ever since Nintendo's gloriously failed Game & Watch multi-screen console. They had been chasing this touchscreen dream for years, testing it as far back as the Game Boy Color in 98 and then again with the Game Boy Advance SP. It failed both times because the screen was so dim it was basically a black hole. The backlight technology just wasn't there yet and you need a flashlight just to see anything on the screen. Rendering complex 3D graphics on both screens would have required a more expensive power-hungry chip, so the bottom screen got all the boring stuff, 2D menus, maps and gimmicky touch controls. Think of it like that one school project where you did all the work but everyone got the same grade. The bottom screen is basically just fluff. Games like Pokemon could run perfectly fine without it. Seriously, you don't need to see your avatar while in the menu, it's just redundancy. The clamshell form factor inspired by the Game Boy Advance SP helped protect the screens and separate them visually during gameplay. But two larger displays meant more wiring, and routing ribbon cables through the hinge became one of the trickiest engineering problems. In order to actually route the ribbon cables through the hinge, 
they needed to twist and turn the ribbon like a paper roll. Basically high-tech origami, except if you fold it wrong, congratulations, you now own a very expensive paperweight. These thin, flexible circuits carry data and power to the top screen, but they were fragile, easy to damage during assembly or repairs. The hinge itself got an upgrade with a click-lock system, letting players snap it into two open positions, solving early wobble problems and improving viewing angles for backlit displays. Inside, the DS ran on a dual processor setup, a 67 MHz CPU for game logic and graphics, and a 33 MHz one for audio, Wi-Fi, and Game Boy Advance compatibility. Basically, one processor was sweating bullets, handling graphics, while the other got all the easy stuff. Powering the processors was an 850 million power lithium-ion battery. Nintendo claimed 15 to 19 hours of playtime on a single charge. Of course, that was under lap conditions, and you would be lucky to actually get 6 hours of Mario Kart gameplay. Interestingly, Nintendo also reused the speakers from the Game Boy Advance SP. Instead of designing a new audio system from scratch, they took the proven speakers and adjusted their placement for the DS's shell, saving them even more in production costs. Wireless play was another smart implementation. For the first time, you could trade Pokemon or race in Mario Kart, all without cable spaghetti. Too bad the DS's Wi-Fi chip had the strength of a potato, often proving that friendships are in fact as fragile as the school's Wi-Fi connection. Besides wireless play, keeping the Game Boy Advance slot was another genius move. It meant full backward compatibility and gave the DS an instant library of games from day one. This was basically Nintendo taking pity on anyone who bought GBA games last year, letting them play those games in the new hardware, while quietly encouraging a little extra spending along the way, of course. So, on November 21st, 2004, after two years of development and manufacturing, Nintendo finally unleashed the DS. And, in a surprising move to capitalize on that sweet, sweet Black Friday cash, they dropped it in the US first. And, shocker, it actually sold, like a lot. Nintendo couldn't keep these things on the shelves, the desperate gimmick that everyone laughed at. Yeah, turns out it was basically money printing brick with two screens. The DS ended up being Nintendo's best-selling console of all time. It even got dangerously close to dethroning the PlayStation 2, which is insane when you remember the PS2 could seemingly play every game ever made and also double as your family's DVD player. Yamauchi's insane gamble actually worked. He got another huge win, even in retirement, proving that sometimes you just just have to trust the guy who's been right about everything for decades. And now, the DS isn't just some weird clamshell toy, it's one of the most beloved innovative consoles ever. And let's be real here, if someone pitched you an idea of a console where you poke virtual dogs with a giant plastic toothpick, you'd probably call them a nudge up too. So congrats you crazy old bastard, you did it, you proved everyone wrong, showing that innovation doesn't always mean making something objectively better, sometimes it just means giving people some weird gimmick they didn't even know they wanted. I left my DS model free in the description, people literally pay hundreds of dollars for similar models, but I'll take subs and likes as my payment. Is this guilt tripping? Yes, yes it is.